you all for joining our stress management webinar. I'm Sarah Bass and I work with Jefferson Center on the community engagement team. Charles Floyd was also a co-creator of this content with me. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to identify the signs and symptoms of stress for yourself or others. We're gonna define the many aspects of stress and the way it is experienced in the context of the five dimensions of wellness. We're gonna talk briefly about, about coping skills and self-care strategies. And if you don't have your workbook pulled up right now, I would highly recommend pausing this video and pulling it up or printing it out. This workbook really elaborates on everything we're going to discuss today and will support you in evaluating the effectiveness of your personal coping skills and self-care strategies, and it will help you implement a personal stress management plan. So it really runs in parallel with this presentation and is useful to have throughout. I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about this program a little bit. So Centered is our new program and is offered in partnership with Mental Health Partners, which is a local mental health center similar to Jefferson Center. Centered is designed to serve employers and their employees throughout the Front Range, from Boulder to the southern end of Jefferson County and into the mountains. This program offers all of the services that are listed here on the screen, wellness classes, health coaching, consultation for supervisors, easy access to therapy with a licensed clinical therapist. And this course is presented by the Arvada Resiliency Task Force to support you all with evidence-based ways that we hope give you all the tools to take charge of your wellness and your mental health needs. So let's go ahead and jump in. So first of all, we thought this was fitting because it's the end of April and plants are starting to bloom in Colorado, of course, depending on where you are. But just take a moment to look at these you can pause your screen if you need to as we talk through this, if you need to think about it. But think about which plant you feel like fits your, how you're feeling currently. So the first one is thriving. It's in its an ideal environment. It's in a pot that fits. It's getting water. It's getting sun. It's happy. The second one is living, but the environment might not be ideal. Its stalk and leaves are kind of drooping. So maybe it's under a little stress. The third one, this air plant is okay, but it doesn't know how it got here. It's not in a pot, it's just in a crack. It looks like it's growing and doing okay, but it's not in its ideal environment. The fourth plant is getting too much or too little of something in its environment. Maybe too much water, too much sun. The fifth one is growing, but something unexpected is in its environment. And the sixth one is on stress overload, right? Maybe it got too much or too little of something for way too long. Maybe its root system is still intact, but the plant overall looks like it's not living very well, if at all. So just think about this for a moment. Which plant do you relate to? Mine is probably closer to four. I'm happy and healthy most of the time, but this time of year brings lots of responsibility and stress for me in school, in work, as a parent, as a spouse, and so forth. So I'm getting too much, kind of everything in my environment. I share this because with my plant, for example, if I just tweak its environment slightly, maybe water a little less, maybe it will be a little less stressed. So we don't necessarily have to have an ideal environment all the time, but we can take small intentional adjustments so that we are managing our plant or our stress in this case a little more effectively. Now take a moment to think about what experiences you or those in your community have with stress. What emotions do you notice in yourself or in others? What thoughts do you notice with yourself? What behaviors do you notice with yourself or others? Again, this is a good time to pause this webinar and just kind of think through what are the indicators of stress in your community or for yourself? Now we're gonna talk more about what is stress? What does stress mean? What are all these different kinds of stress? We're gonna talk through these so that you have a better understanding of the stress you experience. 
These are not listed in your workbook, so feel free to take notes or pause as you need to during this video so you can kind of understand these terms a little bit more. Or maybe just take note of the one that you feel like is where you are right now or have been more recently. I'll start by saying all of these types of stress are just really normal reactions to change. Change may look like something new, maybe something unexpected, like that spider web and that fifth plant. Maybe it's something that threatens your sense of self or that you have little to no control over. Stress, stress actually helps our body address to, adjust to new situations. And all of our experiences, of course, to stress are subjective and unique to us in our certain circumstances. Stress is what helps us survive when these changes come about. So I'll start with you stress in the bottom left-hand corner. This is that fun, almost exciting, positive stress. It enhances our function. It's short-term. We feel we have the coping skills to respond effectively. Maybe we even are experiencing increased performance, focus. Maybe we're more motivated. We're working towards goals. We feel, in general, good about life. It can produce positive feelings of excitement, fulfillment, meaning, satisfaction, even well-being. This is the stress I kind of refer to as the honeymoon stress. Creativity, productivity, connection, they all may be at their peak. Some examples of areas we might experience you stress in are when we're in a new job. Maybe we're really passionate about this new job. Maybe when we're in an actual honeymoon, going on an actual honeymoon. Maybe at the beginning of physical exercise. Next, we'll move on to acute stress. Acute stress is short-term stress as well, but it's more of the traditional day-to-day -day stress. Acute stress is the continuous response to a one-time stressor. Maybe predictable challenges at work, or such as caring for a child, caring for a home. It can also include unexpected events such as a malfunctioning home appliance, an unexpected work deadline, or for me, a traffic jam on I-25. Once that one-time stressor pauses, passes, the stress dissipates. So once that traffic jam clears up, the stress is gone. Once that home appliance is fixed or is repaired enough to get you along a little bit longer or until the repairman can come out, the stress is gone. Episodic acute stress is when acute stress happens frequently or is experienced over an extended period of time. So maybe this is taking on too much at work. Maybe this is holiday stress. Maybe it's working in fields like healthcare as a teacher, law enforcement, maybe parenting. All of these things come to an end, but the stress feels like it can really wear on you. And then we have chronic stress. This is the stress that happens over a really long period of time, maybe with ongoing trauma. We really need, our bodies really need, our relaxation response to happen. With all of the other types of stress, the relaxation response may come and go and relieves our nervous system from, well, stress. With chronic stress, the relaxation response doesn't occur often or at all for a long period of time. Poverty, domestic violence, maybe a pandemic, maybe prolonged grief, maybe global happenings. These can all be that really long chronic stress. If we don't identify and intervene with this kind of stress, burnout can sink in, which is why it is so important to recognize chronic stress and respond accordingly sooner than later. Again, this is a good time to pause the video and take a minute or so to think about what kind of stress you are experiencing more recently. Go ahead and take note of this. We'll cut because we'll come back to it here and there throughout this webinar. Now let's talk a little bit about the biology of stress. Many of you are likely familiar with fight, flight, freeze. Fawn is a newer term that's been added. 
These are our trauma responses, which are really just responses that happen to stress when we're stressed. So fight is facing any perceived threat kind of head on. It's when you feel like you have a chance to win. Flight is running away to escape the danger. It's when you feel like you have a chance to escape. Freeze happens when we feel like we are unable to move or act against the threat. It's when you can't fight, you can't flight, and you feel nothing will really protect you. And then fawn is immediately acting to try to please to avoid any conflict. It's really more that you've discovered a technique that will kind of woo the threat into a more manageable experience that ensures your safety. So maybe this is a people-pleasing tendency. Each of these responses, and truly every response we have, when we wish we'd done something differently maybe, is our body's best attempt at survival. And how wonderful is that? You are all here today watching this webinar because each of those attempts has somehow led you to survive. You've always done the best you can with the information, the abilities, the resources available to you. These responses activate a variety of hormones which engage your sympathetic nervous system. Under conditions of stress, the entire sympathetic nervous system is activated, producing an immediate widespread bodily response. We don't need to get into the biology of this too much. I'm sorry to our biology buffs watching this. We just mentioned these because understanding that this type of stress that you are experiencing and how you respond is crucial to managing and preventing stress. If you can recognize where you are, you can start to regulate yourself in reverse or manage the stress a little differently and maybe a little more effectively. I'll give an example here. When I'm experiencing any kind of stress, I usually start to neglect my basic needs a little bit, or I have a little less patience with my husband. He's usually first to notice this and will say things like, our mirror is coated in dry shampoo again, which reminds me I haven't showered in a couple days. My response is usually to go into flight. I run straight to the shower. Occasionally though, I turn to fight. I think this is a wonderful time to suddenly have the debate about who's gonna clean the bathroom moving forward. This is a pretty surface level example, but take a moment here, pause this video and think about when you're in stress, how do you respond? What does that look like for you? Do you notice you're neglecting your basic needs a little bit? Do you notice you're chronically exhausted? Do you notice multitasking is challenging? Maybe you're noticing you're not regulating your emotions like you usually would. Maybe you feel like you're operating on a shorter fuse with that emotion regulation. Just think about what's going on in your life when you're experiencing stress. You can reflect on the different kinds of stress here. Are you noticing that you respond differently when you're experiencing different kinds of stress? Are you turning to fawn when you're chronically stressed, but fight when you're under acute stress? Just think through this a little bit. Maybe you're even noticing that you're responding in different ways when you're in different roles. Maybe you go to fawn in the face of work, but you go to freeze in personal conflict. What does that look like for you? Now that we've discussed what stress is and the biology of stress, I want to take a moment to think about the different areas that we experience stress in. So we'll move on to the five dimensions of wellness. These are in your workbook as well. The five dimensions of wellness, I'll talk through briefly. They're defined in your workbook and you have space to write in your workbook too. So feel free to move along as I speak. As I talk through them, think about, are you experiencing stress in that dimension? Do you often or commonly experience stress in that dimension? And if so, what does it look like for you? So I'll start at the top with social wellness. Social wellness consists of the relationships we have and how we interact with others. This dimension involves building healthy, nurturing, and supportive relationships, 
as well as fostering a genuine connection with yourself and those around you. This looks really different for everyone. Some fo folks enjoy more alone time and some folks need more social connection. Some are more introverted or extroverted, one might say. So let's say you usually like more alone time but are suddenly booking your calendar with social engagements under stress. Or maybe you are usually more social and suddenly are declining invites and bailing on plans. These thoughts, emotions, behaviors here are, that aren't your typical response are your early indicators of stress. So think about when you are stressed, does it impact your social wellness? If so, how? Again, feel free to pause here if you'd like to go ahead and write a few things down in that part of the workbook. I'll move on to spiritual next. Spiritual wellness is connecting to something greater than yourself and following a set of values, morals, and beliefs to guide your actions and help to form meaningful habits. Habits can also provide a sense of meaning and purpose. So maybe when you're stressed in the spiritual dimension, you feel less grounded less connected to your beliefs, to your values, maybe to nature. For many of us in Colorado, nature can feel really grounding. Do you notice stress impacts your spiritual wellness? And if so, how? Physical wellness consists of making choices to fulfill our bodies in a meaningful way that support our overall physical health. Physical wellness balance all the as balances all the aspects of physical self, which include so many things, right? Maybe sleep, movement, nutrition, hygiene, relaxation, maybe sexual health, management of illness and injury, maybe even the use of drugs and alcohol. So when we're stressed in this dimension, maybe we're feeling physically exhausted. Maybe we're feeling tense. Maybe we're noticing changes in our appetite or in our activity level. I hear that it's generally more common to notice these early indicators for folks. Does that same thing apply to you? Do you usually feel in touch with your body and notice when you're feeling tense or are you pretty far down the line of stress by the time your back's really starting to hurt? What ways do you experience stress in the physical dimension? Now intellectual wellness. This dimension consists of the creativity and mental growth that we pursue to expand our knowledge and our skills. When we're stressed, maybe our memory is impacted, maybe our concentration, maybe our thoughts, maybe we just have lacking creativity, even, even a heightened or decreased sense of self-awareness. My early indicators are generally when I read an email five times and I still have absolutely no idea what I read or my creativity is diminished. Do you experience stress in the intellectual dimension? And if so, how? And finally, emotional wellness. Emotional wellness consists of the process of recognizing, understanding, and accepting our emotions. It involves the ability to stay in the present moment and effectively handle changes and challenges that come our way. Some indicators that we're experiencing stress in this dimension might be mood changes, reactions that are just simply not your norm. Oftentimes I hear folks say that early indicators when they are stressed in this dimension is that they're operating on a short fuse or maybe reacting more impulsively in ways that they usually wouldn't. Perhaps you notice these things in others too. For instance, I notice folks I work with sometimes become disengaged, withdrawn, maybe less creative, myself included, when they're under stress. I notice emotional changes in people in my social circle when they're under stress. Think about how do you experience stress and in which dimensions? Remember your responses may look like fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, and may occur in one or some of these dimensions. And like I talked about earlier, stress occurs on a spectrum. There's all different types of stress as well. 
take a minute now to jot down anything that came to mind in your workbook, workbook or after this presentation about how you experience stress in these dimensions. Now in your workbook on the next page, or just thinking about it if you don't have your workbook pulled out, look at this screen. Think about where you find yourself today. Plot yourself on this, either visually or in your actual workbook. The further out from the center, the more stress you are experiencing in that dimension. The closer in, the less stress. Take a moment to just think about what dimensions you are experiencing stress in and what to and to what degree you are experiencing stress in each dimension. Just notice this. And think about why you're experiencing stress in the ways that you are in each dimension. Do you have less exposure to stress in certain areas than others? Do you manage stress differently in each area? If your stress were more managed, what might the plotted dots look like then? Would they be more balanced? Or maybe you are realizing that your capacity for stress in one dimension is quite a bit greater than another. So maybe intellectual stress weighs on you much differently than spiritual stress. The idea here is just to think about the fact that these dimensions really contribute to our overall well being. And as nice as it would be to be totally in balance, it's just not always the reality. So thinking about what can give and take and how to know when your stress needs to be managed and brought closer to the center in one dimension or another can be really helpful. Now we're going to spend some time talking about how self-care and coping skills can contribute to our stress management and more generally speaking, our overall resilience. Self-care is taking an active role in one's own wellness and is especially important when it comes to engaging in activities that prevent or manage stress. This is important to keep ourselves from burning out so that we can tap into our coping skills and respond intentionally in those moments of stress. Coping skills are usually utilized on the fly during stressful situations. For example, strategies that we can engage in to manage our feelings and our thoughts. And resilience is adapting to difficult situations using coping skills and self-care. The more we can find coping skills and utilize coping skills and self-care that are effective for us, the greater our resilience may become. Next, we have a framework that may support you in thinking about how to cope and start practicing how to manage your thoughts and emotions during stressful situations. Take a moment to look at these. We call these the three R's, very creative. Regulate, reframe, respond. Your workbook goes into these in depth. So go ahead and find these in your workbook if you have it. I'll just talk about these briefly. Many of us kind of unknowingly avoid or shut out negative emotions because it's our first instinct when we're stressed. Our higher functioning brains kind of, and our hormones kind of kick in and we're put into safe mode. Our brain kind of says essential functions only and focuses less on being aware of and in tune with our emotions and is more just operating with those stress responses. Self-regulation is important because it allows for you to respond more intentionally and mitigate stress more proactively. When you look at these on the screen here, essentially what we're asking is for you to think, what am I experiencing? When I notice a shift, how do I regain control? And how can I respond proactively rather than reactively? When we change the way we are thinking about our experiences, we don't let life's kind of slings and arrows get to us much. We can see challenges as opportunities and begin to view our lives in terms of strengths instead of weaknesses. This is essentially being more gentle with our thoughts. And again, your workbook goes through this in detail on pages four through six. 
my suggestion with the workbook is to utilize this activity specifically now or before or as you are anticipating or noticing a stressful situation is on the horizon or just after the stressful situation. Very few of us are going to pull that work back book out, if any, in the midst of a stressful situation. But coping and utilizing these skills can be really useful and their skills, so they take practice. I'll give an example. And feel free to pause here and work through it in your workbook or listen to my example and pause after my example. So let's say make, maybe I've taken on too much at work. When another project comes down the pipeline and needs to be on my boss's desk, let's say by tomorrow, in that moment, I'm not saying to myself, oh, I feel really overwhelmed and I'm going to procrastinate this until tomorrow and finish it under pressure because I don't want to end up cycling into criticizing myself for not turning out the same project I would have if I had more time to prepare. Right? That's a pretty in-depth thought for why I am reacting the way I am in a stressful situation. What I'm usually saying is, is I'll get this done first thing tomorrow and I'll turn it in right away. I'm turning to fawn, people pleasing, knowing that I don't have time today. Maybe when I finish that report really last minute, my self-talk even looks like, dang, you didn't do well on that at all. It's riddled with mistakes that you didn't have time to look over. You can see how this turns into self-criticism quickly. Now I've gotten better at this, but I imagine many folks watching can relate. So maybe now after the fact, I'm going through the workbook and I'm really recognizing the feelings associated with this sort of stress. Maybe I'm reframing my thought now to, it's okay that I made mistakes. My body's natural in instinct to survive was to procrastinate this or to fawn and accept this project to begin with because it made me feel protected from the fact that I might not do this project perfectly. Mistakes are okay because I am human. I'm going to share a couple of brief tips here that might be helpful in regulating yourself. The workbook is great for really intentional thought, but first we'll talk a little bit more about coping skills. So first, utilizing I am here statements. When you name three things you notice around you or in your body, you can reground yourself to the present moment. Jana, you can go ahead and go back. So I am here statements may look like, I am here watching this webinar, working closely with Jana, who you cannot see on the screen, and the sun is shining into my room. This may sound a little cheesy, but it is an on the fly kind of technique you can use to bring yourself to the present moment when you don't have time to pull out your workbook. The second tip I have is to practice mindfulness. These are a good ways to center ourselves in the moment as well. Often I hear folks say that they really like box breathing to manage their reactivity. So this is counting in for four on your inhale and taking a big deep breath in and then exhaling for five. This is about the pace of our body's natural resting state breath and can help regulate your body's, your body's parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. That's quite the word for. So everybody practice for just a moment. You can pause your screen here on this webinar or you can do it with me. And I'll do these breaths really audibly. So maybe before we do these breaths, take a moment to just kind of orient yourself to where you are. Maybe practice those I am here statements. Think about how you feel in this moment. Maybe you're feeling anxiety talking about your stress, maybe overwhelm. Maybe excitement or peace that you aren't the only one watching this webinar needing support regulating yourself. Just notice how you're feeling. You can try to close your eyes or soften your gaze. Think about that emotion. Name it. Now inhale for four. And exhale for five. Do it again on your own. Inhale for four. 
and exhale for five. Now go ahead and reopen your eyes or refocus your gaze. Take a moment here to think about how you feel now. Maybe you're still feeling those emotions that you notice, maybe anxiety, overwhelm, excitement, whatever it may be. Or maybe you're feeling them a little less. Notice how your breath can really be regulating. And again, I am here statements or breath work only take nine, 18 seconds, depending on which one you engage in. And we have access to that in the moment. When we feel like we're stressed and we're starting to utilize those trauma responses, maybe before we go into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, before we say yes to that project, before we've thought about it, we just take those, those breaths. We count in for four and exhale for five. This is a coping skill that is a little easier to try and master. Finally, we're going to talk about self-care. And again, I will only talk about this pretty generally, but pages 7 through 12 guide you through really purposefully thinking about your self-care and walks you through creating an action plan. As I talk through self-care in these dimensions, think back to which dimensions you know to stress in. What do you do to care for yourself in that dimension when you're stressed? Oftentimes, when we think about self-care, it can feel really prescriptive. Run your five miles every day, eat your vegetables, lift your weights, drink the green drink, take your bubble bath. This doesn't work for everyone and isn't realistic. So as I go through these, think about what self-care is effective for you and what new ways of caring for yourself do you want to try? I'm gonna talk through a couple tips for managing stress in the dimensions as you think about this. For spiritual wellness, revisit your why. Asking yourself questions like, what is the reason you do what you do? What is the purpose? Why do you find satisfaction or fulfillment? What you do doesn't have to be related to your job or work either. It can be anything that is well work. It can be caregiving, volunteering, and so forth. It's easy to become stressed if we lose sight of our why. Why are we engaged in whatever it is that we are doing? Getting back in touch with your why, why you do what you do, can be really grounding. It can also help us explore reasons to feel excited again and to bring yourself out of the more intense or perpetual stress and back to that acute or that honeymoon stage. In this dimension, you can also practice the various activities we mentioned for self-regulation, such as meditation or mindfulness to reground yourself to the present moment and regulate yourself after the fact. For physical wellness, just note what feels good for your body. If you're finding that when you are stressed, your first instinct is to combat stress by going on a long run or doing yoga, but that leaves you feeling more depleted, Maybe you instead try to get horizontal and lie down, close your eyes. Give yourself permission to trust your body here. Oftentimes I hear folks say when they are stressed, they want to rest, but rest never really feels them feeling well rested. Rest in this dimension can be passive or active. Both passive and active rest restore the mind and rejuvenate the body by increasing circulation, flexibility, and other beneficial bodily systems. Passive rest might look like sleeping, napping, maybe settling into a comfortable position, softening your gaze, box breathing for a little bit, anything where you can kind of shut out distractions and settle into that deep relaxing state. Active may look more like yoga, massage therapy, stretching, deep, longer breathing. If passive rest isn't working, maybe try active. If active rest isn't working, maybe try passive. Next is intellectual. A tip I have here in this dimension is to find ways to cognitively release or ways to express yourself intellectually. Maybe you read a book you can relate to. Maybe this helps normalize your experience with stress. 
Maybe you engage in a craft to express yourself while sparking your creativity. Maybe you joined this webinar because you want to learn more about your experience. Social wellness. Again, this can look really different for everyone. However this looks though, the tip that I have is to set, side a time, set time aside to engage with yourself or with others. Connection is at our core, Brené Brown says. Connecting with others might also offer a really great opportunity to ask for support, to feel less isolated in our experience, to share our experience, maybe help place our feelings into context. When we talk with others, we realize we're not alone. It's a really important part of reaffirming our sense of connectedness, reframing our perceived problems within the bigger picture, and building social support networks that are invaluable to well being. And then finally, we have emotional wellness. We already talked about this some. Maybe this looks like doing your workbook, noticing and accepting your emotions. Maybe this looks like regulating and responding really intentionally with that. Another tip I have here is to practice self-compassion. One way I like to think about this is treating yourself like you treat someone you care about. So while we can't always take away others' pain, we can validate its existence and provide support to help them get through it, right? So for example, letting yourself make mistakes or not perform to your own personal expectations. Someone you care about makes a mistake or doesn't live up to an expectation, you probably don't instantly make assumptions about their character or their capabilities, but you might, might find this particularly hard for yourself. Giving yourself permission to be human and experience emotion is one way to take care of yourself emotionally. For example, when you catch yourself thinking a negative thought like, I'm such a procrastinator, or I'm so impulsive for reacting that way, Try turning it around and releasing yourself from that feeling. Maybe saying, it's okay that I procrastinated or reacted impulsively. That's just my body's natural instinct to protect my energy and to help me survive. Again, your workbook goes through implementing a self-care plan and evaluating your current self-care's effectiveness. And the more we practice effective coping skills, and integrate meaning self-care into our routines, the more resilient we become. Finally, as you work through your workbook, think about how you manage stress more. What's working well? What's not working? Build on what's working well. When you notice things aren't working, maybe try little changes, maybe something new here or there. My final tip for y'all is to remain hopeful. Stress happens. It is part of life. The experiences that accompany stress, depending on the type of stress and how we reacted, are really challenging to recognize, manage, and prevent. By trying to remain hopeful and with a little intentionality, you will start to learn the signs and symptoms, and you'll be able to practice proactively responding, both in the moment and in the long run. That's all we have for y'all today in this webinar. Next week, we'll talk more about how to limit stress exposure and manage stress overall through boundaries. If you'd like to contact us for any future services or if you have questions or feedback, our contact information is listed here on the screen and you can scan this QR code to leave us feedback. Thank you all for joining us today.